I have decided that I'm going to kill myself. I think it's important someone understand why, so I'm making this video before I blow my head off. The first time I remember it happening, I was nine. Johnny Weller and I were playing in his backyard. The sun was setting over his back fence, warm oranges and reds shining through the bone white slats like a creamsicle against pearly white teeth. Johnny was the cowboy and I was the dirty redskin, stealing his horse. We ran around the swing set, him laughing and me whooping and threatening to scalp him. When he tripped, I ran to where he laid in the dirt, scooping up a handful of air, pointing my finger at his nose, and proclaimed, I got your gun now! BANG! Johnny's head exploded in a tremendous blossom of crimson blood, slate gray brain and chips of skull that sparkled in the setting sun. My hand fell to my side and I stared, open-mouthed, unable to understand what just happened. Someone was screaming. At first I thought it must be Johnny's mother, until she tore open the back door, and I realized I was the one screaming. Johnny's mother crumpled against her son's headless body, adding her broken sobs to my horrified cries. Johnny's funeral was the next week, closed casket. I forgot the sparkling light shimmering across the cloud of Johnny's blood. I forgot Johnny's mother ragdolling my little body, begging me to tell her what happened to her son. I forgot the sheriff telling my mother Johnny was hit by a falling bullet, one of the 26 cases each year. I forgot my father's quiet talks with my mother about how they never found the round that spattered Johnny's smile across the grass. I adjusted. I coped. I forgot. I didn't forget the next time it happened. I never played Cowboys and Indians again. In fact, I can't remember a single instance of any shooting game played by little boys anywhere in my childhood. I do remember the little girl in the park popping her little Nerf balls as she bounced around. She ran up to me, brandishing the weapon and shouting, Hands up! I smiled and complied, dropping my sandwich in mock terror. I lifted my hands to the sky and petitioned for mercy. A true homicidal maniac in the making, she executed me with a flurry of staccato pops. I dutifully played dead, sprawling across my bench. She giggled and proclaimed, Your turn! Shoot me! A sudden sensation of intense discomfort slithered up my spine. I thought of flowers, glittering crimson roses, wet with morning dew. She eyed me impatiently, apparently convinced she might have to nerf me once more to provoke a response. I lifted my finger weakly, pointed at her, and whispered, Bang! This time, I wasn't the one screaming. Her mother cradled her baby's dismembered limbs, frantically clutching an arm, then a leg. I had pointed my finger at the little girl's belly button. The moment the word left my lips, she ruptured like a water balloon filled with punch and soaking bits of crimson-colored fruit. Johnny Weller's decapitated body filled my vision, the slow red of sunset sliding down the front of his striped shirt. I ran. I can't do this anymore. I got pissed at Laura yesterday and put my finger in her face to tell her off. I didn't even say it. I couldn't bring myself to sop my girlfriend's brains off the kitchen floor. I can't do this anymore. All I have to do is put my finger against my temple and say it. At at least I'll go out with a bang. The Amorphous is a very unusual being, if you can even call it that. As the name implies, it is shapeless, its form appearing to constantly change. It is also void of color for the most part. However, the human brain cannot process this properly and therefore fills in the space with darkness, much like the way the brain sees a black hole or space itself. Sometimes when it truly wills itself to, an amorphous can change into any shape it so desires, sometimes even able to change a few colors. It could be for a brief or a long period of time depending on how intricate the form. It takes energy in order for an amorphous to shapeshift. An amorphous cannot be born, it cannot be created, it cannot be destroyed. 
only moved. It simply was, is, and will be. Forever. Throughout history, the Amorphous has had many names. Angel, Demon, Ghost, Spirit, and more recently, a Shade. An Amorphous can be either good or bad. Like humans, some have more morals than others. But in our dimension, good and bad are simple names we use to label things that help or harm us. In most alternate dimensions, no such ideas exist. Amorphouses tend to be incredibly powerful as well. Not only can they cross dimensions, but they have the capability to create dimensions as well. This leads some to believe that in the beginning, an amorphous created our own dimension, our own universe. It is unclear what its intent was, whether this entity created us on purpose or not, whether he has a plan for us or even cares. It is also uncertain whether or not it could have been done by a single being or many. Not to mention how wise they are. Because they have always been. Because they have always traveled. They have infinite knowledge about the world, our universe, and other dimensions as well. Some people seek to gain some of their knowledge by summoning them and trying to get information out of them. But all end in failure. There are also ways of summoning an amorphous. Many of these ways you have probably heard of. Ouija boards, chanting something at a mirror in the dark. There are plenty of rituals. When an amorphous is pulled into our dimension against its will, it can become quite aggressive and angry. Sometimes in rare cases, they react calmly, curiously. When pulled through to our world, it takes a lot of energy out of them, so they tend to stick around a familiar place or object for a while until they have enough strength to move freely again. It's no rush, though, being able to travel through time and space. I'm sure you've made a few connections. Most likely you yourself may have had an experience with an amorphous at one time or other. You're probably close to one right now. We are nice little playthings for some of them to watch stumble about, and they do not fully understand dying, not being able to die themselves. So they enjoy watching us when we do. It interests them to see us cease to move. It's certain humans they find the most entertaining, are the ones who feel the most fear. It's also almost impossible for an amorphous to feel fear. Nothing threatens them. Although they are all-knowing, they can never understand firsthand what fear feels like or what death is like. This plagues them. So many of them watch us and wait to watch us die, hoping to learn something. A few grow very, very eager. They try to speed up the process. Those moving shadows you see at night in the dark corners of your room may not be your mind playing tricks. It could be, probably is, the writhing mass of an amorphous watching you, trying to frighten you, and growing very, very impatient. In November 1930, Joe LaBelle, a Canadian fur trapper, snowshoed into a thriving Eskimo fishing village situated on the shores of Lake Anjakuni in Canada. LaBelle was greeted with an eerie silence. He thought this was very strange because the fishing village was a noisy settlement with 2,000 Eskimos milling back and forth to their kayaks. But there wasn't a soul about. LaBelle visited each of the Eskimo huts and fish storehouses but none of the villagers was anywhere to be seen. LaBelle saw a flickering fire in the distance and approached it gingerly, sensing something evil was afoot on this moonlit night. Upon the fire was a smoldering pot of blackened stew. To make matters more mysterious, LaBelle saw that not a single human track had left the settlement. LaBelle knew something bizarre had happened to the 2,000 people, and he ran nonstop to the nearest telegraph office and sent a message about his findings to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The Mounties turned up hours later, and they too were baffled by the mass vanishing act. An enormous search party was sent out to look for the missing villagers, but they were never found, and the search party unearthed some strange findings. 
all the sleigh dogs that had belonged to the Eskimos were found buried 12 feet under a snowdrift at the perimeter of the camp. All of them had starved to death. The search party also established that all the Eskimos' provisions and food had been left in their huts, which didn't make sense at all. Then came the most chilling surprise of all. The search party discovered that all of the Eskimos' ancestral graves were empty. Whoever or whatever had taken all the living villagers had also dug up the dead as well, even though the icy ground around the graves were as hard as iron. Later on that unearthly silent night, the Mounties watched in awe as a strange blue glow lit up the horizon. The eerie radiance was not the northern lights, but seemed steady and artificial. As the Mounties watched, the light pulsated, then faded. All the newspapers of the world reported the baffling disappearance of the 2000 Eskimos. Although many believed that a rational explanation would eventually come to light, the Anjikuni mass disappearance is still unsolved. When I was a child, my family moved to a big old two-floor house with big empty rooms and creaking floorboards. Both my parents worked, so I was often alone when I came home from school. One early evening when I came home, the house was still dark. I called out, Mom? And heard her sing-song voice say, Yes? From upstairs. I called her again as I climbed the stairs to see which room she was in. And again, got the same, Yes? Reply. We were decorating at the time, and I didn't know my way around the maze of rooms, but she was in one of the far ones, right down the hall. I felt uneasy, but I figured that was only natural, so I rushed forward to see my mom, knowing that her presence would calm my fears, as a mother's presence always does. Just as I reached for the handle of the door to let myself into the room, I heard the front door downstairs open, and my mother call, Sweetie, are you home? And a cheery voice. I jumped back, startled, and ran down the stairs to her. Just as I glanced back from the top of the stairs, the door to the room slowly opened a crack. For a brief moment, I saw something strange in there, and I don't know what it was, but it was staring at me. I'm very worried about my son. More than worried at this point. Terrified. His behavior these past few weeks is not normal, not healthy. It makes me think there's something wrong. At first he would just come and stand at the doorway. He did this at night, just before I'd be ready to fall asleep. I'd roll over to turn off the lamp, and he'd be standing there in the doorway. I used to try to speak to him. I don't do that anymore. He never has answered me. He just stares. A couple of days ago, he graduated from standing in the doorway to coming in and sitting on the bed. He still doesn't speak. I have asked him what he wants. I've asked him if anything is bothering him. It's not like him to be so quiet. He usually waits until my wife is asleep. That's the part that gets me. She always falls asleep before me, and he has never come in when she's awake. But then, she didn't have a hand in this. If something doesn't change soon, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm starting to feel like he knows that I'm the one who killed him. We all remember monsters. We remember the beast that lurked under our bed, the one that resided in our closet, the one that leered at us from the dark shadows in our room. Everyone has had their own personal monster that always kept them on edge. Mommy or Daddy would always turn on the light and prove that no such monster was there. The nightlight that was plugged in kept all the shadows and scary things away. The lullaby would send the monster away, writhing in agony from such sweet, loving words. 
But now that we're older, we've forgotten our monsters. The shadows of the night, the closet, and the space beneath the bed are things we've grown out of fearing, something we care very little about and even consider mundane. The most frightening thing about all of the listed places is knowing that you'll have to clean up whatever mess is there. But did you ever think that that monster is still there? Just because you don't see or don't believe in something doesn't make it any less real. We're all convinced that the monsters only existed within our own minds. But did you ever think that may be untrue? What if we are the monsters? What if those lurking shadows and glowing eyes we swear to see are what we become in the afterlife? Maybe heaven isn't real. Maybe we aren't reincarnated. Maybe we don't just end up being food for the parasites that live underground. What if we become the monsters of our childhood and strike fear into the hearts of those we watch over? In 1983, a team of deeply pious scientists conducted a radical experiment in an undisclosed facility. The scientists had theorized that a human without access to any senses or ways to perceive stimuli would be able to perceive the presence of God. They believed that the five senses clouded our awareness of eternity, and without them, a human could actually establish contact with God by thought. An elderly man who claimed to have nothing left to live for was the only test subject to volunteer. To purge him of all of his senses, the scientists performed a complex operation in which every sensory nerve connection to the brain was surgically severed. Although the test subject retained full muscular function, he could not see, hear, taste, smell, or feel. With no possible way to communicate with or even sense the outside world, he was alone with his thoughts. Scientists monitored him as he spoke aloud about his state of mind in, in jumbled, slurred sentences that he couldn't even hear. After four days, the man claimed to be hearing hushed, unintelligible voices in his head. Assuming it was an onset of psychosis, the scientists paid little attention to the man's concerns. Two days later, the man cried that he could hear his dead wife speaking with him and even more, he could communicate back. The scientists were intrigued, but were not convinced until the subject started naming dead relatives of the scientists. He repeated personal information to the scientists that only their dead spouses and parents would have known. At this point, a sizable portion of scientists left the study. After a week of conversing with the deceased through his thoughts, the subject became distressed saying the voices were overwhelming. and every waking moment, his consciousness was bombarded by hundreds of voices that refused to leave him alone. He frequently threw himself against the wall, trying to elicit a pain response. He begged the scientists for sedatives so he could escape the voices by sleeping. This tactic worked for three days, until he started having severe night terrors. The subject repeatedly said that he could see and hear the deceased in his dreams. Only a day later, the subject be began to scream and claw at his non-functional eyes, hoping to sense something in the physical world. The hysterical subject now said the voices of the dead were deafening and hostile, speaking of hell and the end of the world. At one point, he yelled, No heaven! No forgiveness! For five hours straight. He continually begged to be killed, but the scientists were convinced that he was close to establishing contact with God. After another day, the subject could no longer form coherent sentences. Seemingly mad, he started to bite off chunks of his flesh from his arm. The scientist rushed into the test chamber and restrained him to the table so he could not kill himself. After a few hours of being tied down, the subject halted his struggling and screaming. He stared blankly at the ceiling as teardrops silently streaked across his face. For two weeks, the subject had to be manually rehydrated due to the constant crying. Eventually, he turned his head and despite his blindness, made focused eye contact with a scientist for the first time in the study. He whispered, I have spoken with God and he has abandoned us. 
and his vital signs stopped. There was no apparent cause of death. Hey there guys, this is Master DK. Thank you so much for watching tonight's video. If you like what you hear and you want to hear more, feel free to explore my channel and hit subscribe if you wish. You can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook for updates, and uh, also consider visiting my Patreon and uh, financially supporting this channel. I have uh, several rewards waiting for people who do so. Any amount that you're willing to give is huge to me, and I'll be very grateful. Thank you guys once again, and have a safe night.